Let's thank you. Let's put our hands together. Wandering into the night Wanting a place to hide This weary soul This bag of bones I try with all of my might But I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting A bag of bones Anyone else? When I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I was not alone. He picks me up, he turned me around, placed my feet on solid ground. I think the master, I think the savior, because he healed my heart. I think the same. Come on. I thank God. Hey. Come on, Bryce. I think I deny what I've seen. I got no choice but to believe my doubts are burning. Hallelujah. Like ashes in the heat. So, so long to my old friend. another one that when we have said yes to Jesus that we have been freed from the chains of sin and death. To him lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. It's good to say. Say it. He'll lost another one. I am free. I am free. Let me hear you. I am free. Declare. He'll lost another one. I am free. Yeah. I am free. Oh, I am free. He'll lost another one. Voice. I am free. Come on. I am free. Hey, hey. Hell lost another one. I am free. Yeah, I am free. I am free. Yeah. Hell lost another one. I am free. Yeah, I am free. Oh, I am free. Pick me up and turn me around and place my feet on solid ground. I think the master. I think the savior. Because you heal my heart, you change my name. Forever free, I'm not the same. I think the master, I think the savior. Christ being 
about you all that I needed that this morning I need that Isaiah 40 this is what's capturing my heart this morning because I spent a lot of this week complaining to God a lot of hard things going on in the world and I don't like it and it upsets me I don't understand why God lets things go down and then I remember this he says I why do you complain Jacob why do you say Israel my way is hidden from the Lord 
my cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. I'm so weary. I'm so weak, Lord. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. Yes, let's give him a shout. They will not run. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. My hope, my strength is not found in my ability to fathom the complexities of the challenges that are before me. My inability to heal my children, to calm the storms of war, does not define my reality. God refines me through my reality. So let's worship him. Let's sing to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and let's cry out to him. We don't understand. We don't like it. We don't know. But he does. And we can take strength and refuge in him. I believe in the resurrection that 
eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. Jesus, we need you to face this world, Lord. We need you to for your healing, Lord God. We need you, and we have faith that you will come through because we have witnessed your goodness. Lord, we have witnessed your goodness. Remember.
You're constant, I've witnessed it, and I'm confident I'll see it again and again. You love and I've witnessed it. You heal and I've witnessed it. You save and I've witnessed it, and I'm confident I'll see it again and again. You're good and I've witnessed it. You're strong and I've witnessed it. You're constant, I've witnessed it. And I'm confident I see it again and again. You love and I've witnessed it. You heal and I've witnessed it. You say. Jesus today to what you want to do in our hearts and minds Lord God we say yes to you Jesus we ask that you would take off the cloudiness of our eyes Lord if there's any place in our world that is as foggy as the outside was this morning Lord that you like a fresh wind would come and blow away any distractions out of what you have for us to hear today let us be moved today closer to you conform to your image Lord Jesus we ask this boldly as sons and daughters in the name of Jesus amen you may be seated and if that song always gets me, and I don't know if uh, after singing that, if you don't have, you know, if your blood's not pumping hard, you may want to check your pulse. Um, that one does it to me every time. How many of you noticed the dirt along the drive as you came in this morning? Um, that, that was not an answer to prayer. It was just a gift from God. Um, it, it, we didn't ask for it. Um, the, the drive ever since it's been built, put in, uh, with all the Indiana clay, we've, it's been almost impossible to get, I am really loud up here in my own head. I don't know if I'm loud to you, but I just want to whisper. Um, and, uh, so we, we've never been able to get grass to grow. It's all that Indiana clay right there along. It's hard, it's packed, it's, and out of the blue, uh, Marv got a call uh, this week or last week and said, hey, I have 40 dump loads worth of, tr of dirt, topsoil, I just need to get rid of. Can you use it? <laughs> Marv said, yeah, dump it right here and here and here and here. And they brought a guy out and leveled it all out. And so we may have to live with some dust and dirt and mud for throughout the winter, but in the spring, we're going to have a really lush uh, grass area along that, that uh, and God is just good. Even sometimes he gives you what you need when you don't know you need it uh, with that. Um, how many of you know Audrey Gilmore, our middle school director? You know who she is? You've seen her? Yeah? Okay. If you've cheered, you know her. Um, if you see her today, 
Would you give her a big old hug or a big old high five? Because Friday night, we did the, the middle school lock-in, and we had 80 kids, 80 middle schoolers that were here throughout the building. She had everything planned out. It was a lot of fun. Um, I got credit because I came and helped with registration, so everyone thinks that my wife and I stayed all night. We did not. I was in home, at home in bed by 10, full confession. <laughs> but we had 30 volunteers that worked that, that whole thing, and, and I think they need a round of applause too for, for being able to, being willing to stay. And if you are one of the 30 and you are here this morning, would you just raise your hand right where you're at? Okay, fantastic. If you are sitting near or by one of those 30, would you every five or 10 minutes do this just to make sure they're still awake and with us? Um, I know you got an extra hour of sleep last night, but if you're like me, you didn't get an extra hour. You just woke up an hour earlier than normal. Um, I woke up and it said four o'clock instead of five o'clock. So that's just kind of where we went. But uh, God is good. And, and even sometimes when we, we don't notice it, we don't realize it, we kind of get stuck. I don't know what you are carrying this morning when you came in, what burdens we, 915, we were laying burdens out before the Lord uh, in our groups in, in that prayer time and, and kind of unloading uh, our own life into God's hands. And so I don't know what weight of the world is on your shoulders that you've kind of slung over and you're dragging it behind you. And, but I pray today that you might find a way to lay it down, to, to, to unload it, to put it at the foot of the cross, to, to lay it before Jesus and allow him to pick it up to where you don't have to carry it anymore. The problem that we often have, and maybe I'm the only one, I don't think so, that I will bring a burden to the Lord and I'll pray through it and I give it to him and then when I say amen, I scoop it all back up and take it with me. I'm not real good at leaving it. This morning I want us to figure out how to leave it. How to just lay it down at the foot, at his feet, at the, at the cross and, and leave it with him for him to carry it for us. Because these are crazy times. All around the world it's crazy. Sarah and I, for those of you that don't know, we weren't here last week. Uh, we were in Berlin, Germany. Uh, we were invited by our Berlin uh, Alliance church planting team in Berlin to come and spend some time with them, spend a number of days with them in kind of a pastoral care role where we were praying with them, we were listening to them, we were encouraging them, uh, supporting them as best we could for four or five days. Uh, in their city and where they're at. There are eight Alliance missionaries on the team. They have uh, 10 children between them uh, from, I don't remember the youngest one's age, up through high school, ninth grade. Uh, but it was just great to be able to spend time with them. There are four people that are doing church planting in, on former East Berlin, uh, so uh, is where we've spent our time Four of them are planting churches within the German-speaking community, and four are planting churches among the Arabic-speaking community. And one of the things I did not realize uh, is that we asked them, what, what is, what's the biggest need here? What are you finding? As you're building relationships, as you're meeting people, because there's no church already established they are it. The eight of them are it. And they're trying to establish the church amongst these, these folks. And, and I said, what is the biggest need? And they said, the biggest need amongst these people is community. This is a very lonely city. 55% of everyone living in Berlin lives alone. I don't know what the percentage is here, but that just seemed extremely high. And they said 80% of everyone living in Berlin has an immigrant story. So not only are half over half of them living alone, 80% of them aren't even where they would call home. People are hurting. In our own communities, there's, there's hardship, there's, there's stress, there's, there's burdens being carried, there's, there's hurt, there's confusion. 
I've never yet talked to anyone, whether 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, retirement age, I've never talked to anyone that has said, yep, where I am right now is exactly where I expected to be at this point in my life. Life's filled with turns. Things unseen. Dreams unmet. Hopes unfulfilled. Through Facebook Messenger, I've had the opportunity to reconnect with one of my former students from my youth pastor days years ago. He's a grown man now, family of his own. And every once in a while, he just pops into Messenger and asks how I'm doing. And last Thursday, I got this. He said, hey, Ted, how are you lately? I find myself wishing it was 2009 again before the world turned into the dumpster fire that it is. I'm praying to no one that things will get better. And surprise, surprise, it's not working. Is it just hopeless? I'm open to reasonable suggestions. So as I answered, and we corresponded back and forth several more times, we continued our conversation, and he thought maybe he was ready to give God another try. I encouraged him to zoom into the live stream or check into the live stream this morning. And so, Michael, if you're, if you're on, I hope and I pray today that God's going to meet you where you're at. And I pray that for every one of us, that God would just meet us in our mess, meet us in our chaos, meet us in our confusion, meet us in our hopelessness, in our pain, in our understanding, and also meet us in our joys. Life's not all horrible. Sometimes you get free dirt. God has been working in our midst. And as we continue our journey through Nehemiah, we've seen some incredible ways in which God worked in their midst. So I want to have you turn to your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 10. is where we are at this morning. And we started a few months ago or weeks ago with... uh, with a people that Nehemiah had learned were troubled, they were disgraced, their walls were broken, their gates were burned, life was totally hopeless. That's where they were. And we journeyed with them through the rebuilding of the wall to now where we've reached in the last couple weeks, the rebuilding of the people. Now that they have secured the city of God, they need to begin to live like the people of God. They weren't living like the people of God. They were living like displaced people that had grown up in Babylon and suddenly were back in another place of promise that didn't show promise. They brought a lot of Babylon with them. Last week, Eric walked us through that six-hour worship service. Not literally here. Six hours that Ezra read from the law of Moses aloud. And their, their response to that reading of scriptures was a, another half day of just confessing and, and fasting. It's a natural response that when you read scripture and you see who God is, that we find, woe is me. It was Isaiah who, when, the, when he found himself in the, in the temple and the, the temple was filled with, with uh, the vision of God and his robe falling and, and he said, woe is me for I'm a man of unclean lips. When we come into the presence of God, we see our own sinfulness. And confession is a natural response. Seeking God out. What it's like to come face to face with God when see our own sinfulness and pour out our confession to him and receive that forgiveness and that God begins that transforming work in our life. But we can't stay there. We have to go out and then live out that life. The people of Nehemiah's day, they had built the wall, and now what do we do? The wall's built. Okay, now we just need to live like the people of God. We need to inhabit that place. We need to have God inhabit that place. Where you are at right now, God needs to inhabit your place. When you rise up in the morning, when you go through your day and you lay your head down at night, God needs to inhabit 
that space. The overarching principle that I have, that I found in Nehemiah chapter 10 is this. What you do on a regular basis will determine what you become. What you do on a regular basis will determine what you become. These people had to have a whole new system by which they operated. They need to inhabit the city of God. They need to have God inhabit the city of God and inhabit their lives. And so that meant they were going to have to do some new things. And the people at Israel for years were just simply mirroring the, co the culture of the Babylonians. They became like them. A people who had lost their relationship with God. Had lost what it meant to be in the presence, to live in the presence. And now after coming back to God, the people, we find them at the end of where Eric left us last week and where we're going to pick up this week in making a binding agreement, looking ahead. What does life now look like since we are in this place, God is in this place, we want to renew that relationship, we want to live out Him. Look at verses 28 and 29. I'm not going to bore you or even attempt all of the names at the first part. It's enough to say those who sealed it. So we have a, let's just go back to 38 in, verse nine, in chapter 9. In view of all this, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our leaders, our Levites, and our priests are affixing their seals to it. And then he lists all the people. Those who sealed it were Nehemiah the governor, and then all of the people all the way down to verse 28. The rest of the people, priests, Levites, gatekeepers, singers, temple servants, and all who separated themselves from the neighboring peoples, underline that, separated themselves from the neighboring people. No more are we going to mirror the Babylonians. We have a new life, a new way, a new God, a new king. For the sake of the law of God, together with their wives and all their sons and daughters who are able to understand, all these now join their brothers, the nobles, and bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of God given through Moses, the servant of God, and to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord our God. I've entitled the message this morning, Cross My Heart and Hope to Die, because that's really what they were doing right here. They were signing this binding agreement and they said that I, they're, they're bind themselves with a curse, hope to die, and an oath, cross my heart. Cross my heart, hope to die. Whatever it takes, we want to live this out. This, this was not just a kind of cool thing to do at the end of a sermon or at the end of a day of reading scripture and fasting and praying. This was a solemn promise. What they were stepping into was an oath before God. And that is what we are called to do. We're called to a life of holiness, a life of obedience, a life that is really countercultural. It goes against most of what the world says is right. What they say is right, we tend to say wrong. What they say is wrong, we tend to say right. And we've got to figure out how a way to live that out on a daily basis, and only through God's grace, only through living it out through faith, is God going to make this happen. Verse 29, obey carefully. Okay, that's not accidents. That's not haphazardly. That's on purpose. Carefully, with intentionality, with effort, with purpose. Obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and dec decrees of God. This binding agreement was a promise. They're, they're making a promise, and the, the Hebrew word is the same that God used when he gave the Ten Commandments. You shall not. What they're saying right here is we shall this. We shall this. We promise to this. Same word that God used in giving the big Ten Commandments, they're saying we shall. This isn't flippant. It's not haphazard. 
It's thought through. It's considered. It's chosen. We are going to live this way in this place. We promise. We shall. That's a, a seriousness. It was a complete denouncing of the way they were living and changing to this God's way. This, this life of holiness, this life of obedience to his laws and his commands. Signifying that, you know what, God, you might know the best way to do this, so we're going to do it your way. We're going to seek you first in all things. And look where they start, verse 30. We promise, underline that, we promise not to give our daughters in marriage to the peoples around us or take their daughters for our sons. They were starting with renewing the home. You know what? When we lived in Babylon, we didn't give a whole lot of consideration to who our daughters married or who our sons married. What we were really looking for was something of convenience. Is this marriage going to help me out? Is this marriage going to benefit our family somehow? We didn't care where they came from, who they were, what they believed. But God, we, we see now that in your word you said that we shouldn't marry outside for them, Israel, outside the faith for us is how we would understand that. Christians should never marry a non-Christian. Non-Christian, I, we, we, I, I've been premarital counseling. That's the first meeting. Give me your story. I've got to make sure you're both on the same page where it matters most. You can disagree about a lot of things and still have a very good, vibrant marriage. You disagree about God, there's going to be conflict all the time. I've, I've not taught, I've talked to a lot of people who one spouse believes, the other spouse doesn't. I've talking to the believing spouse, never once have they said, I think it's better this way. That he or she doesn't believe. No, they would change that in a heartbeat. Because God says that's the best way it, for it to work. This is how I designed it. That, that in a marriage, this is foundational to everything else you do. So they said, we promise we're going to go back to the way God established it, back to the way God prescribed it, the way he designed marriage and, and the family to function. So we establish a pattern in our homes that's going to place God in the center. Moms, dads, husbands, wives, that's what you need to do. That's what they're promising right here. We're going to put God in the center of this house of this home, of this family. And everything's going to revolve around him. What you do on a regular basis will determine what you become. If you, on a regular basis, put God in the middle of your home, you will become a godly home. If you, at times, push God to the side, do what you want, then your home's going to reflect that. You're going to become a home that God is attack on. He's in the guest room, but not in the living room. We knock on his door when we need him. That's what you will become. Our nation is trying to redefine family. Make it what we want. Take God out of the picture... It's no longer one man, one woman as God designed it from the very beginning. Now it can be any combination of people who just simply love each other or enjoy being in each other's company. Now to me, I call that a friend group, not a family. It's different. God has a different design for family than he has for friend group. The world would like to just mesh them all together. That won't work. Not the way God designed it to work. The world says love is the key to making you a family. I think it's important, but I don't know that it's key. Because then any loving relationship can be a family, and that's not true. Commitment to the design of God for the family is what will make you a family. 
Commit to the blueprint. We'll make you a family. If we're going to renew this nation, we'll go back to God's plan. We'll go back to His design. Marriage is sacred. Society is working to take God out of the equation. Told, you know, keep religion out of my house. But God has defined and designed the family to be the foundation of society. What it's built on. The way it operates. A nation is only as strong as the homes that live in it. So when we begin to redefine, when we begin to tear apart what family is, when we move away from God's design, we tear apart the very foundation of society. That's the world we're living in. We need to reclaim. As followers of God, as families of God, we need to reclaim, we need to redo, we need to renew the home. We need to make a promise that we're going to do it His way. Eric shared last week that he and Kendra are in the rookie season, in the empty nesting phase of life. Sarah and I are sophomores. We're a little ahead of you, but not far. We're going to be no help to you in how to navigate what's in front of you. And I can look back and see all the mistakes I made. And I know the enemy just would love to get a hold of that and say, boy, what a horrible father you were. You would be blew it there. You should have done this. And, and he's probably right. There are areas where, yeah, I should have done this and I should have done that. And I can worry that we, we didn't do it right or I'm too far down the road to fix anything. And maybe some of you are in that spot with, you know what, I never had God in the middle of our relationship. Now the kids are out and I just, I don't know what to do. God is never out of time to fix things. God des- loves, desires to put things back together, to heal broken things. And so we bring those things to God. We bring our families to God. Even if we're estranged, even if the relationship's not where it needs to be, even more so, we bring God into the middle of that and begin to build new patterns. Renew the home. They said, we promise to do that. And what you do on a regular basis will determine what you become, and that's no, uh, no less important than in the workplace, which is the next place they go to. We need to renew the workplace. Verse 31, when the neighboring peoples bring merchandise or grain to sell on the Sabbath, we will not, underline that, We will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on any holy day. Every seventh year, we will forego working the land and we'll cancel all debts. Again, this was something God had designed. Remember commandment number four, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Exodus chapter 20. Chick-fil-A, probably the only business that takes that serious. Isn't Chick-fil-A wonderful? The Lord's chicken. I mean, just mouth-watering. Sorry, you can't go there after church. Um, Wet the appetite a little bit. You'll flood the place tomorrow, they'll thank me. And, And Deuteronomy chapter 15 talks about explains that the the year of canceling debts. So every seventh year was kind of a Sabbath year. And you kind of rebooted. You didn't plant crops. That's a big that's a big trust. Because you had to trust that God was going to make the crops in the sixth year big enough to cover the seventh. And let the ground rest. Nowhere in scripture do we ever read of that seventh year. I don't know if they ever did it. They never reached a year of jubilee. That I know they never. We, we, we heard that in the 50th year. After seven sevens, 49, then the 50th year is huge. I don't ever remember reading of that celebration. We need to get back. I'm not saying don't go out to eat on Sunday. I, that's up to you. But God needs to be in the middle of the workplace. The way in which we operate the workplace 
And what they're saying is we promise to carry out our work with integrity. No more cutting corners, no more bending the rules, no more shade, shady ethics. This is all about in, restoring integrity to our workplace, whether we're the employers, the employees, or the customers. Back in February 2022, when I first came to Eagle, I think the first sermon series that we got into was called God and Mondays. Does anybody remember that? If you were here, do you remember how many remember God and Mondays? That's pretty much how sermons work. <laughs> Very few will remember. I want to encourage you, go online, go back and listen to some of those messages uh, throughout the week. Because this is what, this is what we're, we're doing. We're, we're putting God back into, we're asking God to inhabit the workplace. That there's no separation between sacred and secular. That God is just as concerned about what goes on in your workplace Monday through Friday as he is concerned about what goes on in this place 9.15 to 11.15 in the morning on Sundays and 4 to 6 in the afternoons when the senior high meets. He doesn't, isn't any less concerned about Wednesday afternoon in the office than he is Sunday morning right here, right now. But we sometimes regulate him to right here, right now in this place and kind of forget that he shows up to work with us every day too. Wherever your work is. Stay at home mom, stay at home dads, he's right there with you. Each and every day, moment by moment. We need to allow him to inhabit that space. We need to renew that space. Bring him into it, invite him into it. What we profess on Sunday has to be reflected in how we live on Monday. Every day is take your Savior to work day. We need to renew the workplace. And then they got really serious because they said we need to renew the church. Look at verse 32. We, re we assume the responsibility, underline that. We, everyone who signed, all the temples, all the priests, all the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, all who separated themselves from the neighboring peoples for the sake of the law of God, together with their wives, all their sons, daughters, who were able to understand. Everyone of age, everyone. Every one of us right here, children downstairs, we assume the responsibility for carrying out the commands to give a third of a shekel each year for the service of the house of our God, for the bread set out on the table, for the regular grain offerings and burnt offerings, for the offerings on the Sabbaths, new moon festivals and appointed feasts, for the holy offerings, for sin offerings to make atonement for Israel, for all the duties of the house of our God. We, the priests, the Levites, and the people have cast lots to determine, underline this, when each of our families is to bring to the house of our God that set at set times each year a contribution of wood to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law. Verse 35, underline this, we also assume responsibility for bringing to the house of the Lord each year the first fruits of our crops and of every fruit tree. As it is written in the law of the Lord, underline this, we will bring the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle and of our herds and of our flocks to the house of our God to the priests ministering there. Moreover, underline this, we will bring to the storerooms of the house of our God, to the priests, the first of our ground, ground meal of our grain offerings and of the fruit of all the trees and of our new wine and oil, and we will bring a tithe of our crops to the Levites, for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all the towns where we work. A priest descended from Aaron is to accompany the Levites when they receive the tithes, and the Levites are to bring a tenth of the tithes up to the house of, a God, of our God to the storerooms of the treasury. The people of Israel, including the Levites, are to bring their contributions of grain, new wine, and oil to the storerooms where the articles for the sanctuary are kept, where the ministering priests, the gatekeepers, and singers stay. And underline this last line, we will not neglect the house of our God. This was new to them. Their life in Babylon had no house of God. 
There was nothing to care for. There was nothing to, 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 uh, to, to bring things into. They understood now, and this was the longest list of all the we wills, we promised, we, we resume, assume responsibility. We will not neglect the house of our God. That word neglect means abandon. We will not abandon the house of God. We're going to make it a focal point of everything our family does. We will not abandon it. What you do on a regular basis will determine what you become. The longest list of promises had to do with relationship with the house of God. For them, the temple. For us, that, I think, I think the, the easy transition is that that means the local church. Wherever you call home, wherever you call your local church, assuming because you're here, 98% of you say, this is local church. Eagle Church is my church. We promise not to abandon Eagle Church. We promise not to neglect Eagle Church. Or whatever, you, wherever you go. So the question is, what is your relationship with the house of your God? What is your relationship with Eagle Church? or wherever you call home. Because here we see that worship, giving, serving, participating was no longer an option. We promise not to. We promise to res assume, resume responsibility, assume responsibility for everything that needs to go on here is my responsibility. No matter where I sit, no matter where I am, who I am, we take on that responsibility. This is just how a responsible, this is normal follower of God's stuff. Normal life. We will not neglect. I remember growing up and not going to church on Sundays. I don't know what we did, but I remember it wasn't until I was probably 11 that my mom and dad, who had gone to church earlier in their life, but when we moved to Kansas when I was six or seven years old, we just never found a church. We neglected that part of our life. We abandoned it completely, to the point of I could never remember going to church until I was 11 or 12 years old. And mom and dad said, you know, we probably need to find a church. And I can remember mom and dad sitting down with me and saying, we've decided, and when you're 12, that decision's made for you. My mom and dad didn't leave the decision up to me at the age of 12. We've decided that we as a family are going to go to church. I'm like, okay, I have no idea what that meant. But we're going to go. And you know what? From that conversation on, never once on a Saturday night did we have a conversation about, well, do you think we should go to church tomorrow or not? We decided right then, at that moment, that was never going to be another question. You see, gathering for worship is not an option for a believer. It's not a question we make on Saturday night. Do we go? Do we not go? You go. And that's not legalism. That's just normal life of a person who loves the Lord, who loves Jesus. I don't leave the office on Tuesday night and go, should I go home or not? No, I love my wife. I'm going home. If I didn't go home, that would be weird. <laughs> if I showed up at your house after work and said, what's for supper? That would be weird. So it's not weird for us to say on Sunday morning, I'm here. Because I love the Lord. And I love his church. And I love his people. 
And this is normal believer stuff. There was a regular habit. And what you do on a regular basis will determine what you become. There was a habit, a discipline of giving. Okay, it wasn't just showing up. There was a discipline of giving. They mentioned it two or three times through here. They talked about that, that annual shekel, third of a shekel that they brought in. They talked about the first fruits. They talked about their firstborn. Now, understand, all those firstborns were brought in for sacrifice. Because it had to be the firstborn, had to be the, uh, the perfect one of the flock that was brought in to be sacrificed at the temple. And it was everyone's responsibility that when you were raising the firstborn, the best you brought in. That included your sons. Now, your sons weren't sacrificed. They also allowed you then that either you put them into the temple service, as Hannah did with Samuel, and she dedicated Samuel to the Lord and brought him to the priest and He stayed and worked at the temple. Or you could buy them back. You could give an offering and redeem the firstborn back into your family and take them home with you. But they were gods. You just understood that. That was normal. So bringing a tithe, bringing an offering, giving money to the church is not a question I have to ask. It's normal believer stuff. Every time Sarah and I get paid, it's a check we write. Yes, we still write checks. And put it in the little black box in the back on your way out. There's something about writing the check for us that is a reminder of this, of what we do and why we do it. And again, that's not legalism. That's what being a responsible follower of Jesus means. And in that, it creates a a generous spirit that it's a reminder that everything I have, my savings account, my 401, 403, whatever, I don't even understand all those, Sarah's all that. We got a guy. I trust the guy. We understand that all of that isn't mine anyway. It's God's, and I'm simply the steward, and he's asking, you know what, as a reminder that I own everything and I'm giving it to you to live out and steward for me, would you just bring a tenth of that, a tithe, and put it into the storehouse to make this function the way I want it to function? That's just normal. There's no legalism in that. I love being able to speak on tithing from the vantage point of the church doing well. Sometimes, you know, preachers only preach on tithing when the budget's a little short. And we need it. we got to push. And then there's guilt and manipulation. There's none of that this morning. We are doing well. God is good. I think I mentioned a few weeks ago when I preached that we're at 96% of where we expected to be budget-wise. I don't know any other churches that are there. God is good. You are faithful. So maybe I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm guessing there's some of you that have never gotten this discipline, never understood this whole idea of giving and that how, it, how important it is to our own development. That, that, that I can give because I know God's going to provide for my needs. As we were talking about that this week, Eric was sharing stories of how faithful God was through people. And, you know, someone would write a check for $400,000. I'm not doing that. (laughs) If I did, don't cash it. (laughs) It's not happening. But God blessed this person. Remember the story? Eric's told it, I I think, once. I've heard it a couple times in different settings of, Someone was leaving Eagle, moving away, and they said, we just, you know, handed him a a card. He thought it was a thank you for, you know, ministering to our family, and he just stuck it in the the console of the van, and he drove around with it for two or three days, and he finally remembered it, and he opened it up, and it was a half million dollars. That's not in my car either. (laughs) But this is the understanding... That God owns everything. 
And out of generosity, out of trust and faith in him, I steward that. And he's saying that 10% of that just bring to the storehouse so that Eagle Church can function the way I want it to function. So that it can do the things in this community we want it to do. So yeah, we come to worship every Sunday because that's what lovers of Jesus do. And we bring an offering and we put it there. We text it or we, I don't know, it'll be up on the screen later, all the ways you can do it. I write the check. Sarah writes the check. Because that's what lovers of Jesus do. It's normal. This is all the renewal process for Nehemiah's people. And the question isn't ever, because he talks about worship, he talks about giving, he talks about service in the temple. And the question isn't, should I serve in a ministry? The question is, which ministry should I serve in? There may be a little guilt in this. I'm hoping it doesn't come from me. Holy Spirit can do that work in your life. They all took turns bringing the wood for the altar. Now, the altar was, you know, when they burned the sacrifice, that altar never went out. That fire never went out. It took a lot of wood. And all of the people, all of their families said, we will share the responsibility to make sure the wood is there. They all took turns chopping wood, which means greeters, eagle kids, eagle students, hospitality, missions, worship and tech, small group, many ways for you to chop wood for the kingdom in this place. And we all assume the responsibility. Charles Spurgeon says, a person who is really saved by grace does not need to be told that he is under solemn obligations to serve Christ. The new life within him tells him that. Instead of regarding it as a burden, he gladly surrenders himself boldly, soul and spirit to the Lord. It's what believers who love Jesus do. Worship, give, serve. This is the renewal process for Nehemiah's people. It was a natural progression from moving from troubled and disgraced broken down and burned to renewal, to life, to revival. This is the path you went through. These are the doors you walked through. Worship, giving, service. This is what this binding agreement was all about. This is what God has done. Therefore, this is what we will do, cross our hearts and hope to die. Last week, we understood, we we began to understand who God is, that looking up. We acknowledge all that God has done, the looking back. We see our sin and our confession when we look in. And then we see a new way of living as we look ahead. A window into another kingdom with another king. We have lived the Babylonian way for long enough. It's not working. Our homes have become mirrored images of the godlessness around us. We tend to blend in quite nicely. We've mirrored the conduct of the world in our workplaces, crappy attitudes, questionable actions, compromised ethics. We've neglected our responsibility in the house of the Lord. Abandoned my responsibility to the kingdom. Don't show up regularly. Develop the Sunday-only spirituality, sporadic in financial support, less sporadic in our physical serving. Now is the time to make a binding agreement, a promise. We will assume responsibility. We will, all the things I asked you to underline. In all of these promises to God, they are committing to a life of holiness, a new way of living. I want to invite the worship team to come back up. And do you remember back in August, before we actually got into Nehemiah, 
we started walking, uh, we, we started walking this road with this word consecrate. Focusing on that word, we had a, we had a cross set up in the, in the middle of the room. Do you remember it? I've got a picture, I think. There you go. Do you remember that Sunday? Do you remember, do you remember we were all invited to take the cards that we were given put them in the right on them, what we needed to give up, what we needed God to, to, to remove from our life, to, to consecrate ourselves, to set us apart, what we needed to give. And then we put it in the envelope and we laid it at the cross. Do you remember what you wrote if you filled one of those out? Because now is when we look back and ask, how are we doing? How's that going? That wasn't a one and done. That was a beginning and now we're still in that journey and we're saying, where are we at now? Three to four months we've been travailing toward renewal and revival, a life of surrender, living by faith. And as we grow spiritually, we're going to have times where we recognize some things need to change in our life. We're going to need another go to the cross moment. Maybe daily. Daily. We've got a priority that's out of line with while God's priorities. We have a prior commitment or decision that has is, that is slipped. We all do that. We make a decision. We set out strong over time. We sign it. We put it at the cross. And then two or three weeks later, we're kind of back in the rut. Maybe something needs to be added. A new step of obedience. Exercise a new spiritual muscle. Something needs to be dropped. We've, we've picked up Babylonian things. Whatever it is, becoming aware is the first step. And then we discover and we center on what God has to say about it, and then we decide to go God's way. We renew, we promise, we, we, this binding agreement. We promise, we will, we assume the responsibility. That's where we're at this morning. What is God saying to you? Where are you at in this, this promise? Where are you at in the, in the commitment that all the things God's done for us and now we're looking ahead to this new life? What's this life look like for you? My friend Michael, yesterday my phone dinged yesterday evening and this is what he said. The first one was Thursday, so this was Saturday night. I've been speaking with God. And while it feels awkward for now, a few days in, and I'm already feeling better about life. Feels like it's going in the right direction. What direction are you going in? What direction are you headed? Because what you do on a regular basis will determine what you become. And God's not done. People are not hopeless. Life is not hopeless. I promise. Cross my heart and hope to die. Father, we thank, are thankful this morning that you are our God. That you are a God with a plan, with a purpose. That you are a God who redeems, who loves us. Father, we give our life to you this morning. I pray that all across this room that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts on what we need to lay before you. Maybe for the first time, maybe for the hundredth time. Father, for your redemption, for your renewal, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. please stand offer your entire being as a living sacrifice let the Lord reveal to you create me a clean heart oh God and renew a right spirit within me invite him in create in me a clean Heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Yeah. 
Creating me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Have your way, Lord. Creating me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. So come and light up. darkest parts of this heart. I give it all up for you. I give it all up so you can light up, light up. Even the darkest parts of this heart. To fill it all up with you. Fill it all up with Jesus.
Restore the joy of our salvation. Restore the joy of our salvation. Restore the joy of our salvation and fill it all up with Jesus. Restore the joy of our salvation. Restore the joy of our salvation. Restore the joy of our salvation and fill it all up with Jesus. Restore the joy of our salvation. Restore the joy of our salvation. Restore the joy of our salvation and fill it all up with Jesus. And fill it all up and fill it all up. Fill it all up with Jesus. Fill it all up. might be renewed in you oh Jesus the beauty of your offer the, the, the sacrifice the, the care the love oh Lord we just thank you so much for this relationship that you bring to us this ability to be renewed in you and to walk with you through you by you and for you Jesus we worship the Son oh thank you Father Holy Spirit I try you in God I love you amen you may be seated Hi, I'm Sven Christensen with USA Homestays. Fall is clearly in the air. We've got Colts games and we have Thanksgiving approaching. Just like thousands of people go to a Colts game, thousands of international students have come to Indianapolis and they would love to spend Thanksgiving with you. So you have an opportunity to host two or three students to your home for Thanksgiving Day. We'd love to talk to you. Go to usahomestays.org and fill out the application. Go Colts! Okay, that is a new... Uh, opportunity that you have. There are literally thousands of international students. They don't have the time or the resources to head home for breaks when our college kids come home. So if you ha would love to host one or two of them, uh, eaglechurch.com uh, slash events information there will get you where you need to go. Uh, also with Thanksgiving, November 16th, uh, we work with our local partner, uh, Matchbook uh, Learning, and we provide a drive-through uh, Thanksgiving dinner. So we are looking to supply turkeys, mashed potatoes, and rolls. So if you would love to get involved in that, the deadline's November 16th. That's when we're going to put them all together. Um, again, eaglechurch.com slash events. And then after church today uh, is the informational meeting if you're interested in the Sicily trip with Tom Lange Bartles or the Bosnia trip with Mike Steffi, uh, they're going to be meeting right after today to answer uh, a lot of your questions. And Kim has. And we have a lot of great events. This one I don't think it works. It didn't come on. 
We have a lot of great events in November and December, but two that I want to highlight. On November 17th, we are having an all-church family game night. So it's a great way to get to know each other, and a lot of those deeper conversations spiritually will happen later because of the relationships that are made of just spending time together. So November 17th, 6.30, we're going to have board games, basketball, bring your whole family. If you don't know people, it's a great way to do that. We ask that you sign up so we can have enough uh, snacks and supplies for you guys. The second event that I want to invite you to is a women's dinner on December 8th at 6.30. It's $15. Our theme this year is Adore, and all the women are invited. If you are new here, this, again, is a great way to get to know people. Kimberly Sovine will be one of our speakers. She's excellent. And you've heard her husband, Kurt, speak on some Sundays, and you will be really blessed by her. Um, so the worship, we're going to have fellowship. It's great for the women before we get into the busy season of Christmas to take time and focus on Christ and who he is. So I hope you can come. You can sign up for these events on eaglechurch.com slash events, and they have all of the November and December events on there. Fantastic. Stand up for the benediction, and one last announcement. Tonight, 6.30 is our worship night, first Sunday of every month. Um, and uh, regardless that the Colts are playing at 4 o'clock, we're going to be here at 6.30. Maybe we'll pray for them. I don't know. Um, but uh, we will be praying, and we will be worshiping. So come on out. We're up in the loft. Yes, up in the loft. Um, benediction, Psalm 46. I thought this was fitting for where we've all been today. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. My translation in my head reads, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help just in the nick of time. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, we will not fear. So as you go to live this new life, this renewed, revived life, May you go without fear. May you go with all of his strength, knowing that he goes with you, before you, beside you, behind you, to his glory. Amen? Amen. Have a great week.